Hey there, Internet. It's Friday, so it is time for another episode of Underground Lucha Things. Unless you're watching this on literally any other day, then congratulations. Today's the day for Underground Lucha Things. I'm your host, R. Felix Finch, a guy that despite being involved in the wrestling business over a decade, has never watched this show, and I'm here to remedy that. But for any remedy, you need a doctor, and the doctor I have with me, unfortunately, she's not a DMD. I've got the one, the only, coming in from Hawaii, Loose Cannon, Angie FN from Midcard Mana. Angie, how you doing? Bang, bang. I'm good. Not a doctor, though. Let me just make that very clear to everyone. Don't have a doctor degree in anything oh, not even at all. Not in education? No? <laughs> no. Just nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> just maybe maybe a, like working on my master's of thugonomics. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like, it's like turns out thugonomics, not a PhD offered at any accredited institution that I'm aware of. Yeah, not especially not in Hawaii. <laughs> I was lucky to find a master's program in thugonomics. So. <laughs> Here we are. Yeah, here we are. To uh, If you can't tell what this episode is going to be the focus of, this episode is called They Call Him Cage. They Call Him Cage. And this is season one, episode 12, and it's from January 28, 2015. And this is probably the biggest feature we've ever had for Brian Cage to this point. Oh, I, yeah. I, I thought you were gonna. I thought you were going to speak there. That's why I took my water sip. Well, no, I was trying to think if there was if there was anything bigger thus far, and no. I mean, this is the first time uh, that we see Dario Cueto pretty much at the very beginning of the episode actually interact with Cage and talk to him as he's as he's pumping iron, lifting them weights. Yeah, he, um, he's, he's just sitting there curling, working up. Uh, let, let's be honest. <laughs> Cage's promo game, I was curious if he was like prototype back in OVW and he's actually literally supposed to be a machine because his uh, promo game isn't exactly on point here. Yeah, it's it's funny and this is probably, it's so mean that I said this, but I will admit that I said it and also say that I, I have nothing but respect for Brian Cage. He's a super cool dude when I met him, um, but I have my note says, Dario can barely contain his laughter because you can see his sort of just spreading smirk on his face. And I said, me too. <laughs> it's just same, same, Dario. And, you know, I he doesn't need to talk. He, he doesn't. He does not need to talk. He just needs to go in there and wreck. And, you know, he's shown that he is more than capable of doing that. Spoiler for the year 2020. Him paired with Taz, with Taz doing all the talking, is perfect. It is it's, great. Yeah. It, it, it is the ideal position, the ideal way to sell him. It's super old school, but some old school things work for a reason. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I was so happy when when I, I discovered that that was going to be the pairing moving forward. I was just like, yes, yes. How how is this not a thing from the very beginning? What is so good? Yeah, and if we start off our first match of the show, Mil Muertes with Katrina versus Phoenix, and Mil get getting in a lot of strikes, and he's able to catch and throw Phoenix hard, pretty much any way he charges, any way he jumps. Uh, there's some flip landing with high impact offense, and this actually ends up being Mill's downfall because. In, a, in what I think is a brilliant finish, Mill gives him the superplex, but Phoenix hooks the leg and gets the pin for yep. the win. And, and a real shock victory. And gets the scoop. I, yep. I think that's like an old Eddie Guerrero finish, because I feel like I've seen that finish in a couple Eddie matches where someone will suplex him, but he catches the leg. I feel like you're, you're probably right. And it's the classic uh, strength versus speed sort of thing here. You know, you see... Mil Muertes has absolutely the strength advantage, and it's not even close. But Phoenix has unequivocally the speed advantage. And all it takes is for you to be faster than them for the count of a three. Yeah, that's that's absolutely where he, where he was able to scoop that. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we get another cage video package, 
with him no selling a street fight. Like he's getting hit with, <laughs> he's getting. I think he gets hit bottles. With, I think he's like with a, a cabinet, an apple box, or some kind of wooden yeah. pallet. And he's yeah. just wrecking things, which is funny because uh, when it reminds me of when they first did that Wardlow promo at I want to say it was uh, All Out when yes. they were introducing yes. when they were introducing the world to Wardlow. People said like, "Oh yeah, this is like a Brian Cage promo." And I had no idea what they were talking about. I saw this and I'm like, "Oh, they totally ripped off the Brian Cage promo." Absolutely, yeah. No, I, that was the first thing I thought of when I saw that too. I'm like, so so very Cage, and you can tell like. That's kind of like if if Cage was was more of a bad guy, absolutely. I think that that Wardlow is is exactly if if Brian Cage were less likable, um, is where Brian Cage would have ended up, hundred um, percent. Again, uh, and this is something that I come to over and over again that we've talked about, in I think almost every episode that we've talked about. Again, a video package that would have been better sans voiceover. Like, if, if it was just the video and maybe dramatic music, that would have made him seem so much so much tougher and cooler to me than with the voiceover. The voice the voiceover is just, I don't know, there's something rhythm, rhythmically with a lot of them that just, they, they, they are weird. They're weird. They don't fit together. Yeah, it's because uh, the footage is, the footage looks great, and in fact, in the future we might be talking about footage being used in a different way. But for now, we're going to talk about this six man match between uh, Agenis, Superfly, and Aerostar against Mister Corte- uh, Mister Cisco, Cortez Castro, and Bale. And this is a lucha style versus brawl. And while the focus is clearly on Rick's old crew, the luchadors get a lot of flash and are able to show off. A lot, including a uh, splash from the top of one of their shoulders where, while uh, one is standing on the second rope. I do like the amount of tandem offense that the crew members get on the luchadors. By the way, do these guys ever get a name? <laughs> I, I don't know that they ever get a name. And uh, the luchadors are getting more highly featured than I expected since the beginning of the match. But the crew ends up getting the win with that 3D code breaker of theirs. Yeah, this match was actually very, like quite long compared to all the other matches in this episode. So I thought it was a really great sort of exhibition, not only for the three luchadors, of course, our Hines, Superfly, and Aerostar. And I thought this match was a really great debut showcase for them, like I said. And it shows just how well they work together cohesively as a team, even without the direction of Big Rick. You know, and I think that's really important, or going to be really important moving forward, as you start to see them as a trios. And Lucha Underground definitely is very much known for having a lot of trios tag team stables. I believe that a lot of trios tag teams today or in American wrestling today kind of drew off of Lucha Underground. And of course, the, the story tradition of six men tags in Mexico and in Japan. But Lucha Underground, I feel, is what made the mainstream wrestling audience here really kind of pick up on it and know it. Yeah, because like the Freebird rule has been a thing forever, but it's not they weren't really a focus of American wrestling. Uh, whereas like it may and maybe Ring of Honor, but I think even the Ring of Honor features kind of came after Lucha Underground. Or so I'm not. I'm gonna have to take a look, but, but yeah, uh, I think the only ones I know that have been doing trios forever is Chikara, because because they're based in Lucha Libre. Yeah, and we get a Vampiro interview with Prince Puma and Conan, and I think that I'm, like, I'm like, oh, finally an interview with Prince Puma, and nope, Conan cuts off, takes over, and uh, is answering everything for him, and uh, Vampiro is trying to get to very the- Conan. <laughs> yeah. Vampiro's trying to get Puma to speak instead, but Conan just says, you know, everything he'll need to know, he'll see in the ring. And uh, there's a little scuffle between Vampiro and Conan. So are we going to see a return to the ring for either of these? Who knows? But Exciting times. I loved that. I thought that that interview was handled 
beautifully. Like you mentioned for the last episode, Vampiro's interviews are really good. I like the structure of them. I like how much character you get out of those short little interviews and how good he is at really pulling out those moments. Of course, you know, this is all much more dramatized than I think you would see in regular wrestling shows because it's it's production is focused more like a television show rather than a wrestling show. But that being said, I think that Vampiro is perfect for this. And I love the little um, name cards they have for them. Like it says Vampiro, uh, announcer slash legend. I think it says the same thing for uh, Conan, coach slash legend. <laughs> But Which I, I thought is great. I think it's great that, you know, maybe these are people that you don't really know a whole lot about. They're not, you know, the big WWE stars or WCW stars. Like, so for people that are just tuning in because they remember, oh, um, Macho Man Randy Savage from the, from, you know, WWF and WCW years ago or NW or all that, and they see this. I think it's a cool way of introducing, you know, these guys are important. We should be listening to them. We should be paying attention to them because their legacies in this area of wrestling that maybe you don't know quite as much about are just as important as these big stars that you do know about. So I like those little touches. Yeah, and in a main event where we're building two stars, we have a a Lucha Underground Championship defense of Prince Puma against Brian Cage. And Conan joins ringside for this match. Cage is probably the most legit looking guy on the roster. Like, Big Rick may actually be, like, taller and maybe bigger. But Cage just looks so much larger. He, the added the cut, Wolverine. Yeah. The yeah. added cutness is just an intimidating visual. And uh, there is some shock. A high-octane offense from Puma. And he's even able to super Right from Cage. the start. Yeah. Yeah, right from the start, Puma comes in hot. Yeah, because this is a threat, and you can clearly see that Cage is a threat. You don't need to sell me on Brian Cage. You show me Brian Cage, I'm like, <laughs> okay, he's a badass. <laughs> yeah, he he. Co- There's no question. For all I know, he cooks dog biscuits for a living at a you know at a Soho bakery. But all I know is that this guy looks like he will kick any ass put in front of him, and that's a good thing. But uh yeah, no, he looks incredible. Yeah, and hundred percent, and just, yeah, I just can't. I, you are absolutely right. I just that's the best thing I've ever heard. <laughs> the dog biscuit bakery thing. So thank you for that. <laughs> no worries. It, uh, it's, a, it's a real thing. I in Austin there was a bakery specifically for dogs, and I don't. I guess because Austin's so hipster, they got a lot of business. But it's just still a weird business because. But what bank lent them the money for that one? That's all I. That's all I want to know. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, Puma's shockingly able to keep up his offense against Cage, and he goes to the top rope. Cage pushes the referee into the rope, the to knock him off. And as Puma gets down, the ref is uh, condemning Cage. Cage takes Puma to Dick Kick City right in front of the F to right in front of the ref to cause the DQ. And yeah. And a Cage continues his attack, and Conan comes in with his pimp stick to try to get Cage off of Puma. And he's met with a title belt to the head, which Cage then rips in half, holds up rips. high. That, as Conan is left ble- uh, bleeding in the ring, that is a really cool yep. visual. And if that would have been where we go off, I would have been like, oh, that is great. But that's not where we go off. We go off nope. with the. Except, you finally get to get to see a little bit more of this person you've been real curious about. I'm excited. Yes, we cut to Cueto's office, and Mystery Leather Lady is now in there. And she's looking for a man who owes her. And he's like, yeah, I, I pay my debts. And she notices she, he's in the temple, and he while he gives her leave to talk to any of his roster, he asks if there's a name, and she says she has one word, which I think was Talta. I don't know. Like, oh, I, I th- what the word was? Uh, yeah, I think the word might have been Thalta. No, it was Matanza. Oh, Matanza? Matanza? 
Okay, and he said, well, Dario says that means nothing to him. So, who, so who knows? Mystery. And hopefully we'll find out very soon. But, uh, because now I don't, great. Now not only do I not know who Mystery Leather Lady is or what she wants, Matanza means nothing to me. I thought that meant Apple, but that's Manzanita. <laughs> or Mansana. Sorry. I have no idea. Yeah, Mansana is Apple. So, <laughs> so uh, my bad. Anyway, though, uh, what are your thoughts on this episode, Angie? The first time I watched it, I, you know, Brian Cage, of course, this is the big Brian Cage focus. Uh, the This time, I, I appreciated it a lot more, I think, than I did before. Because Brian Cage now, to me, I think means a little bit more than just the the machine. So getting to see, getting to go back and see him in Lucha Underground and be like, this is his big, first big feature in Lucha Underground. And look at the kind of video package they gave him. I mean, they made him look like a million bucks. Conan made him look like a million bucks. Everybody around him just really, really made him look so good. I also liked seeing a little bit more of the establishment, like I said earlier, of uh, Mr. Cisco, Castro, and Bale as a trios. Getting to see also a little bit more of the mystery woman that we've sort of seen around before this and getting a little bit of that narrative in there. And the mystery grows of Matanza. What is that? What does that mean? I don't know what it means. I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> well, so I thought <laughs> so I thought it was a good episode overall. And especially now knowing what I know upon rewatch, I'm really excited that we're finally starting to get in on who Mystery Woman is. Yeah, and like I said, for me, uh, I did love that they finished on that. But let's go back a little earlier in the episode. Uh, I did like that uh, Mil Muertes and Phoenix. It was kind of cool cause, because Phoenix did not look like he was going to win that. He was on the receiving end of most of that match. That was kind of a cool way to feature him. And yeah, the trios is is good to see. And, it, and trios also gives people more opportunity to be featured. I've always loved that about trios. And Cage, I think one of the big things, like him ripping the belt in half, him not caring about really the title as much as just hurting Puma, I think is a good story beat for him. Even though, you know, he lost the title, he lost his opportunity in such a dumb way. But hey, you know what? That's not on me. I'm not a writer. And yes, I want to know who Leather Lady is. I hope we get to find out more about Leather Lady and Manz Ma Matanza, not... Ma, not uh, uh, not not man, Mananza, which I think is apple, or Manzanita, which might be an apple soda. <laughs> Who knows? Again, I don't speak Spanish. Bring me the Russian or Japanese, but let's leave the Spanish behind. Anyway, Angie, <laughs> let everybody know where they can find you. So I am also part of two shows that are based out of Hawaii. First one is Mid Card Mana. That's the main one that I've had going for years. Is all five, you know, people that watch my videos, and we talk, try to talk a little bit more about current events in wrestling, tying back to some wrestling history, and focusing on some, especially like I said, current events with everything going on in the world today and how it ties into wrestlers as real people. And on the flip side of it. I'm also part of this show called Valley Isle Collective Ringside. And it's me and a couple of guys from Maui. We talk a little bit more about the lighthearted side of wrestling, focusing on more of our opinions. You know, what's our favorite botch? Uh, what's our favorite entrance song? If we had to take a move from Haku, what would it be? I, I said Chokeslam. Another guy said he wanted to be punched by Haku, which I thought was stupid because then he'll die. But, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you can find me here, wherever you're watching this. If you're on YouTube.com slash Wrestle Flame, then hit that subscribe. I'm at 750. I need to get another 250. Then I can actually broadcast from my phone. And we can do 
some amazing things together. If you can get me at FriscoFlame.com for all my merch. You can get me at uh, anywhere you get your podcast. We'll just look up Underground Lucha Things. And as always, you know, just find me here, uh, contact me, talk to me. Look for me on Twitter, R. Felix Finch or Frisco Flame, or even Lucha Things Show. And uh, yeah, we have pins. I will be sure to post about the pins more often. I've been getting a lot of my pride pins out there, but I even have an Underground Lucha Things pin and my own mask pin, which may become an actual mask sooner than you may think. Anyway, Angie, thanks for being here. And absolutely for myself, for Angie, peace out, party peoples. I will see you next time.